Good morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. And a warm welcome to those listening on the dial sermon service. Just before we begin, um, just to remind you that we have, uh, or we're looking for suggestions um, of organisations or uh, good causes that we can support um, uh, from some of the money that we have got. And uh, I've already had one suggestion, which I'm not going to tell you about uh, at the moment, but just to keep it in your minds that you've got till the end of July to come up with some ideas of, um, as I say, good causes that we can support. But we're going to begin this morning with, Here I am, Lord. Let us pray. Merciful God, we remember today how you reached out through the ministry of Christ, welcoming those whom society had rejected, accepting those whom the world considered unacceptable. You have time for us just as we are. We remember how you called Matthew the tax collector, how you dined with Zacchaeus, how you touched the lepers, and how you showed mercy to the woman caught in adultery time and again breaking the mold, offering us through his faithfulness, forgiveness and new life. You have time for us, just as we are. We remember that you forgave rather than condemned, built up rather than pulled down, 
encouraged rather than criticized, drew near rather than kept your distance. You have time for us just as we are. Merciful God, we rejoice that you accept us today, not for any actions on our part, nor through anything we may do, but simply by your grace. We rejoice that you value us despite our many weaknesses and our repeated faults. It is your nature always to have mercy, your grace inexhaustible. You have time for us just as we are. Help us to express our worship through receiving the love you so freely offer and celebrating your gift of new life. You have time for us just as we are. Lord, we praise you. And here as us together we say the words that Jesus, Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading, reader this morning is Anne Maxwell. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve designating them apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons these are the 12 he appointed simon to whom he gave the name peter james son of zebedee and his brother john to them he gave the name bonerges which means sons of thunder Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Amen. Thank you, Anne. And your pronunciations were spot on. As I said, you just say a word with confidence. Nobody's going to argue with you. That's what ministers do every week. <laughs> the disciples were an interesting group of men, made up of five fishermen, a tax collector, and six others whose occupations we just don't know. They all came from very different backgrounds and were very different in nature. The question that arises is, why did Jesus need disciples? One misunderstanding about Jesus' disciples is that he did not begin his ministry by calling these men to follow him. We're told in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus had been traveling around the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching about God's kingdom, and healing the sick and the infirm, long before he felt the need to have helpers. In each city and village, crowds would gather around him, and Jesus was moved by their lack of hope. And as he looked at the gathered people, he saw flocks, a flock of sheep without a shepherd. You have to remember that it had been over 400 years since God had spoken through the prophet Malachi 
the writer of the last book of the Old Testament. And in response to this, Jesus calls 12 men to come and join him in his mission. We're told in Luke's gospel that he went up onto a mountain to pray. And there he stayed all night. And then in the morning he returned to those who traveled around with him and called 12 of them to be his special followers. And even at this early stage in his ministry, Jesus recognized that he needed help. Help if he was to reach as many people as he wanted to. In Matthew's words, the harvest was plentiful, but the workers were few. Jesus needed assistance because of the size of the task at hand. And also because he knew that one day he would have to leave the people. And he wanted to make sure that they still had shepherds to lead them. Over the next three years, the disciples were to undergo an intensive period of training. For three years, they watched him heal the sick. They listened to him preach in large crowds. And when the crowds departed, they listened while he explained to them the parables that he had told the people. For three years, they lived together, constantly in the presence of the Master apart from the one week that they spent away from him when he sent them out into the villages to preach about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick on their own. This was a time of intensive training and demanded a lot of the disciples. Simon Peter, for instance, was married and probably had a family. So he left more than his fishing behind when he decided to follow Jesus. A timely reminder that following Jesus isn't an easy option. It demands real sacrifice from us. Remember, it was Jesus who said, take up your cross and follow me. But the training that Jesus gave the disciples was to pay off. And apart from Judas, the disciples all played major parts in the spreading of the gospel after his death. For example, Peter went to Rome and Thomas ended up in India. The fact that Jesus called people to follow him wasn't uncommon in first century Palestine. Most rabbis and teachers had their followers. Even John the Baptist that we talked about last week had those who followed him around. And we remember how after he, was, he baptized Jesus, John told the people to follow Jesus. So it's not strange that Jesus had disciples. What is interesting is that he called 12 special followers. 12 men who would spend quality time not only listening to what Jesus had to say, but also going out and putting what they had heard into practice. Followers of certain rabbis would spend years at the feet of their master before they would be trusted in any way, shape, or form. Jesus, on the other hand, sent his disciples out into the cities and the villages almost immediately. And here we see most clearly the difference between Jesus' disciples and the followers of other leaders. For Jesus, discipleship is not just something to be thought about. It is something that is to be acted upon. And that's why the New Testament contains almost no examples of Jesus spelling out a theory of being a disciple. Rather, it concentrates on giving concrete examples of what a disciple ought to be doing. For Jesus, faith without action was dead. It was useless. And he spent a great deal of time showing his disciples what they were to do, rather than telling them what to believe. By your fruits you shall be known. It's not about what you may or may not believe. It's about how you put your faith into action that really matters when it comes to discipleship. So when you look at those 12 men, you see a pattern emerging that might help us as we try to follow in Jesus' footsteps as his disciples in 2021. Discipleship begins with the call to follow. We are called to adopt a new way of life. A life not centered on self, rather on the needs of others. For discipleship to even begin, we have to be prepared to walk the path that Jesus has taken before us. 
even if it means walking around as if our eyes were closed, being guided by the hand of Jesus. It's not easy. It takes trust. Secondly, a disciple needs to learn humility. Not the false humility that makes us look good, but the kind of humility that reminds us that we serve a master whose feet we are not worthy to wash, but to whose table we are all invited to eat. It is the kind of humility that keeps us working for his cause even when we feel like giving up because of criticism or a lack of help or just because we're too tired to go on. That's when we remember what he did for us and how he even went to the cross for our sakes. And so we pick up our task again and see it through to the end. Real humility is knowing who your master is and what he has done for you. And thirdly, discipleship is about recognizing that we don't follow Jesus in our own strength, but that we are offered a support and an encouragement, especially when things get tough. Jesus often talked about sharing our burdens with him. He said, come to me all whose loads are heavy and I will give you rest. He knew how hard it was to try and do everything on your own. And he was so impressed on his disciples, the need to share with each other. And most importantly of all, the need to share with God. So often we miss out on what God has in store for us. And all because we're too busy to stop and tell God that we are too busy. That we need his help. We think that all we can do is to keep slogging away. Hoping things might get better. When all the time God is trying to tell us something that will release us. But we're too exhausted to listen. If Jesus taught his followers anything it was this. Make sure that you keep praying and talking to God. Before you do anything. That way. You will always know what God wants you to do. Fourthly, Jesus showed his followers that discipleship was about service. It was about loving one another as we love God. And maybe more importantly, as we love ourselves. The supreme example of this is seen in Jesus washing the feet of the disciples just before the Last Supper in the upper room. Here was the Master, the Son of God, on his knees, a towel round his waist, washing the feet of his followers. To be a disciple of Jesus, you have to be willing to do anything that you would want others to do for you. There was nothing that Jesus wasn't willing to do for those he had come to save. He was even prepared to die for them. And having gone through these things, Jesus then shared with the disciples his teaching. He explained the meanings of the parables and he helped them to understand the miracles. But he did this in the context of all that he had taught them about following and humility and service. Jesus wasn't interested in what the disciples had in their heads. He was more interested in what they had in their hearts. That is what discipleship is about. It is about what is in here. And that is what we are challenged to teach everyone in the Old Kirk. That what matters to Jesus is what is in our hearts, because that will dictate what we do with our lives. And the final aspect of discipleship that Jesus taught his followers, and possibly the most important aspect, was that you had to go out and tell others about who Jesus was and why he had come to earth. If you don't do that, then all the good that the other parts of discipleship might have done for you will soon fade and disappear. Jesus taught the disciples that to keep alive that feeling that he was with them and that he would never leave them, then they had to carry on the mission that he had begun. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, Peter called those who would listen to come and follow in the footsteps of Christ to come and be disciples of the living God. He did that not just because he wanted to fill the church and to obey the command of Jesus to make disciples of all nations, 
but because he wanted to remain close to the master. The disciples learned the lesson of discipleship well. Because in just a few decades, those men spread the gospel throughout the known world. But what about today? What about the old Kirk in Ayr in 2021? Are we ready to take up the mantle of being Jesus' followers? Are we ready to be his disciples? Are the members of this church prepared to be the successors to the likes of James and John, Peter and Andrew? Because if we're not, who is? There is a story I've told you before of how when Jesus returned to heaven after his resurrection, he was met by Gabriel who asked him, Lord, what's going to happen if that bunch down there fail? What's plan B? And Jesus quietly replied, there is no plan B. In other words, Jesus had placed the whole future of the world in the hands of 12 men who had walked and talked and shared with him for just three years. And if they were to give up, then there would be no one left to carry on the work. Now he places a similar responsibility on us. As the church here in air, Jesus has called us to be his disciples. He's called us to follow, to be humble, to serve, to learn, and to tell others. And if we don't want to do that, then he has no one else he can turn to. We are his eyes, his ears, his hands, and his voice. If we don't stand for him, then who else will? It's a daunting task that has been placed on our shoulders. But it's one that we must respond to. We cannot ignore it, hoping it will go away. But as we decide on how to respond, remember this. Jesus has promised to be with those who follow in his footsteps. And since he didn't let the first disciples down, then why should we worry that he will let us down? And finally, remember this. We are not alone. There are other churches and congregations around who are in exactly the same position as the old kirk. Maybe if we work more closely together, we would all be better disciples together. Come and follow the Lord and be disciples of Jesus. He needs people of all shapes and sizes. The only qualification you require is that you love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. The vacancies are there. Are you ready to fill them? Amen. Now I'm going to invite Andy Cree to lead us in prayer. Dear Lord God, we give thanks for all your creation around us, the sun that warms us, the rain that refreshes us, the seasons, each one different. We pray for an end to this vi virus which is causing so much pain and sorrows around the world. For a time when loved ones can gather in larger groups, the singing in church by all again. We pray for the missing in that apartment block that collapsed in Florida, USA. Be with any still alive, trapped there. May they soon be found. Be with us all, Lord, the lonely, the sick, the hungry, the homeless, the poor. No matter how low or down we feel, may we, may we re remember there are people worse off than ourselves. Be with our queen, her family in these troubled times, her government, both local and national. May they set a good example to the people. Be with your church around the world, as well as here in the Old Kirk. For members unable to be here, as well as a housebound, let them know that we have not forgotten them. In this time of fallen membership, guide us in the future ahead, not only here in the Old Kirk, but in churches everywhere. Be with our minister, David, and all we work so hard on our behalf. Help us, Lord, to play our part in making the Old Kirk a friendly, warm place of not only worship, but in the work of the wider community as well. Be with all of us, Lord. Help us to be the disciples that you want us to be. 
These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Andy. We close with Show Your Power. mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love, now and evermore. Amen. God bless and keep safe.